This is a Saddleback Church podcast. Hey friends and welcome to Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast designed to help you deepen your faith, or as Linda looks forward to saying to every week. It's the show that helps you grow. (laughs) I'm Jason, this is Linda, and we're on the spiritual growth team here at Saddleback Church, which we love to remind you that Doable Discipleship is a part of the Saddleback family of podcasts, so make sure to go to saddleback.com slash podcasts to learn about all of the podcasts from Saddleback. Friends, we're just going to dive right into it because we got Saddleback's own Pastor Andy Wood with us today. Andy, how are you doing this? this well, it's Monday, but Tuesday for people listening. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for being flexible and, and including me in this podcast. Oh, well, of course. You're always, always a welcome guest. We will always have a chair available if you ever <laughs> wanted to stop by. <laughs> um, Andy, today we're talking about better decisions, Yes. Um, which we just finished at Saddleback a series called Better. And so why don't you frame up for our listeners, because there's some people um, who aren't Saddleback members who yes. listen to this, about what the series was about and why we're doing better decisions on this podcast. Yeah, the... The big idea for this series for me personally came out of uh, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, David, who's on our staff, he and I, we were in the Bay Area at the time. We hired a trainer to help us. And she's this like really strong, kind of 15, 20 years older than us um, woman. And she said to us, she said, when you work out, make it your goal not to not to have like a perfect fit body, but to get better physically. Mm -hmm. So every year get a little bit better. And then uh, a few years ago, another mentor of mine, uh, a guy by the name of Jeff Henderson, did a teaching series and uh, teed it up. And I was like, oh, I really, I just love that brand, that kind of concept. But the big idea really is that so often when it comes to progress in any area of our life, whether it's fitness or money or relationships, we have an idealized version of what Mm -hmm. we want to become, of what we want life to be like. When we shoot for that ideal and we miss it, we end up frustrated, discouraged, And we don't make the kind of progress that we can. So this series has really been a few weeks of us focusing on how do we make progress. Uh, So many examples of this in the Bible. Uh, Paul uh, talked about this in particular in Philippians when he talked about, I forget what's behind, I press on to what is ahead. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea like a runner pressing forward. Um, Another great resource that I talked about in the series is a book called The Gap and the Gain. And the Mm -hmm. idea is that um, there's always a gap between where you are and where you want to be. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of spiritual growth, there's the image of who Jesus is and who we are, and there's a gap there. Um, and then there are gains that we've made along the way. And if we were to focus on the gap, we would constantly be mm-hmm. discouraged. So we want to focus on the gains that God's helped us made mm-hmm. and making continued gains into the future. So that's the that's the big idea of the series. Yeah, so this was, it was a uh, five-part message series, better vision, better priorities, better mindset, better relationship with God, and then, uh, or in uh, this one, better habits, it was the one in the middle of it, and then it ended ended with better relationship with God, um, but it was originally supposed to end with better decisions. Yes. So talk a little bit about why we made the switch, and then we'll dive into doing the content here for better decisions. Yeah, so uh, I think last week, maybe Tuesday morning, I had already pretty much written this message. Um, I ha- actually had probably three messages in one message. I was trying to figure <laughs> out how to cram it in. And then um, on Tuesday morning, I felt like I just got you know prompting from God that I needed to switch direction, yeah. uh, primarily focusing on relationship with God, that if you make all these areas of your life better, but your relationship with God is mm-hmm. not better, then all that mm-hmm. stuff is, is kind of pointless. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was really kind of like a, I don't know, like a, a kick to get going or to mm-hmm. reignite that fire in our love for God. That's where the message went this last weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I still felt like, man, I want to, I want to find out a way to deliver some of that uh, helpful, better decisions content. And you guys were and here we are. willing. <laughs> yes. Well, perfect. We're, we're, we're excited to talk about this. And so we wanted to kind of start the conversation around better decisions, around the idea that, that really people think about decisions already in terms of kind of two buckets, good decisions and, and bad decisions, right? right? Is, is you can tell someone, hey, that was, a, that was a bad decision. Or you could praise someone for saying, that was a great decision. Right. But really what what's underlying that is this definition of good and bad and how we're looking at defining what makes good in a decision, what makes bad in a decision. So mm-hmm. I just, I was wondering as you are, as you were 
thinking about this topic of decision making, how do how do we look like in this moment in terms of uh, of the culture and the place that we find ourselves in at at handling these definitions of good and bad for decision making? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of different ways that we could we could go, particularly with that question, Jason. I think um, in terms of good and bad, you know, the way I think about a decision to know whether or not it's a good decision or a bad decision, Jesus gave us a very clear uh, metric on that. He said, you know, you'll know somebody by their fruit. Mm-hmm. So the fruit of a person's life, um, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mm-hmm. gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. You did it. I mixed the order up, but... I think I did, um, but the the fruit of a person's life being that's you you know a decision you know wisdom based upon its fruit that's good or bad. But also then if you go to John chapter fifteen when Jesus talks about something that's fruitful, mm-hmm. he can make it more fruitful. Mm-hmm. So our lives, God wants our lives to be more fruitful. I would think of better decisions as like you know more fruitful. A good bad is like fruit no fruit. Better <laughs> decisions is like m- more fruitful. Um, and then in terms of when it comes to decision-making in the way that we think and the way that we make decisions, w- one of the things that I think we see as we grow and we mature, um, when, you're, when you're younger, you, we tend to think more black and white or more binary. Mm-hmm. And there are some places where it, it's good to think binary, you know, like yeah. in terms of, if I can say this, God made man and woman. That's sure. a, that's a binary. That's the word that's used a lot in that conversation. So just to clarify, yeah, that's a good place <laughs> to be binary. Um, but then there are areas where there are things that maybe I'll give you a classic example, like with your parents when you're growing up, you think your parents are really good, mm-hmm. and then most of us go through a time where we think our parents are <laughs> bad. And then I haven't got there yet with my kids. Yes, I, I'm not looking think forward you're to that. <laughs> yes, and they're probably like all under ten. Is oh, it? they're four, two, and oh, yeah. five oh, months. Yeah, they think so you're yeah, amazing. <laughs> so then you go through this like uh, almost maturing as mm-hmm. you become an adult, where you see your parents. When you, and usually it starts when you have your own kids. You're mm-hmm. like, oh, I see in me. I see mm-hmm. there's good and there's like there's wrong in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're held together. So you become less binary in the way you see your parents. You see the good and the bad at the same mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. So th- in terms of decision-making, there are places where things are more binary and there are things that perhaps aren't, there's a continuum less of like a good yeah. and bad, all right, all wrong. Mm. So how, how would you advise somebody or what guidance would you give to help them see who or what they're relying on to make their decisions? What's underlying their decisions? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that there's a couple of different, like, uh, things that help influence decision making. Just clarify, like leverage points with decision making. Mm. Um, one of the things I talk a lot about with my kids, my my older ones in mm-hmm. particular, who are sixteen and fourteen, we have a lot of conversations about their friends. Mm-hmm. So the friends that they choose are influencing the decisions that they make. And I I have heard this little phrase like you become the sum total of the five closest yeah. people to you. Yeah. So friendship is is one place i would also say your source so this is another conversation that we talk about in our home where your mind you're you're constantly absorbing information knowledge there's inputs whether it's a teacher or it's a news source but all of that that is influencing how we think eventually is impacting what we decide yeah and if we're not aware of those sources that are coming in Mm -hmm. then eventually we we may make decisions that the two categories, and this is more binary probably than it really is, but we talk about truth and trash. You can fill your mind with truth mm-hmm. or trash that mm-hmm. that's influencing your decisions. So all of that is just being mindful. There's the stuff on the outside that's coming at us, but then from within we're deciding out of our own desires, you know, good desires, bad desires that are influencing the decisions that we make. And uh, that's, you know, partly the flesh and mm-hmm. partly the spirit of God that lives within us that oftentimes are, is at war. All of that is influencing the, what, 30,000 plus decisions that uh, people say. That, yeah. the, I don't know who counts those decisions. <laughs> yeah. but like, How would that uh, even work? Yeah. That's, uh, that's impressive. <laughs> I, I I should say in in a few weeks we're actually going to be doing a whole episode on here on influence in the topic of influence so uh, so look out for that in, in a couple That's weeks. Great. Um, I 
There's an app that we've talked to about a bunch um, at this church called Noom, mm-hmm. um, and what it does is uh, it, the researchers from Noom they they found that the average adult makes 122 informed choices every day. So that's like a more complex choice, not mm-hmm. something that you're just doing what am I automatically. Have for no, yeah, <laughs> it's an informed choice every day. Now, most people don't. Uh, carry around a Bible with them that every right. informed choice, they open it up and they look for their proverb or whatever it is to help them. Um, or they don't uh, stop and say, you know, a long prayer about their about right. this choice in front of them. So the question is, what what wisdom can we offer to people who, knowing that there's so many choices, these informed choices that we make every day, but so often we don't necessarily go straight to the place that we know we get the most wisdom from. What wisdom can we share for people um, mm-hmm. on, on how to make better decisions given those um, circumstances? Yeah. So there's there are like foundational components, right? So there, as the proverb says, Proverbs 1, 7 says, the foundation of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot in that. It, yeah. One of the images that helped me, there's this um, beach up in Northern California called Goat Rock Beach. Mm, okay. And Goat uh, Rock Beach. Yeah. It's Shout like out a, Goat Rock Beach. It's <laughs> it's a pretty cool place, uh, about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. Stacy oh. and I went on like this getaway there one time. And apparently like the week before we had come, there was this couple, they were walking on the beach and there was like this rogue wave that came in. Oh, and dear. Just, like, you know, oh, no. Killed the dude. Oh no! Um, and apparently, like I, we noticed it. There, something about the winter time and storm systems. I think it's about the same time that Mavericks would come in. Oh sure, there'd be like these massive waves that would come, and they could be like twenty five feet, and they crash right on the shore. Wow! And the uh, the person that died, like in essence, they they did not have the fear of this like storm system that mm-hmm. was right there. It was mm-hmm. a beautiful day. They're like, oh, I'll be fine. Yeah, and really. Their thought, I'll be fine. Like, I'll, I will violate the ocean. I'll be right. fine. <laughs> sure. And so, I think of that in terms of the fear of the Lord, and that God has structured the universe, and He's structured life in such a way. For life works, He works. He has He has values. Mm-hmm. He has things He cares about. He's holy and set apart. So when I approach decision making. Like I am a friend of God, but I'm not. God's not necess- God's not my buddy. Like He doesn't. He <laughs> yeah. doesn't like compromise His values or principles for me. Sure. As much as He loves me, He's still God. Right. And so, when it comes to decision making, uh, so much of wisdom and good decision making comes out of the understanding that there's a God, mm-hmm. and we are, or I am not Him. I don't want to be Him. Right. I, he's the one who is worthy of worship. He's the one that holds the universe together. Um, And if I understand, the more I understand his ways, the way he thinks. And the the thing that's interesting about Proverbs is Proverbs are not the same as promises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like God gave us the book of Proverbs as a description of how life works and how he structured the universe or the Mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And you have people in their folly They'll be like, well, I'll I'll be the person that is prideful but doesn't suffer the consequence right. of that, and then eventually, like life catches up, and maybe there might be one prideful person that their life doesn't become a train wreck out of a hundred or mm-hmm. fifty mm-hmm. or whatever, and that then they're like, well, I could be that person, but humility is really that I think that if you work to, as the scripture says, humble yourself before the mm-hmm. Lord rather than like needing God to humble you, yeah. that you, that openness to, there's another proverb that says there's a way before each person that seems right, but in the end it leads to death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I like to just be mindful of the fact, well, this could be that moment, like this mm-hmm. decision, this thing, this could be the time that ends in death <laughs> and I ruin my life or I make a stupid decision. So for, for me, I try to think more in terms of like, what are the principles mm-hmm. for decision making that guide decisions that are there, whether they're a rule of thumb or they're a plumb line or they're, and 
there are certain things that Jesus has framed in the Sermon on the Mount in particular. Sure. Like when he talks about at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you do these things, you listen to them, you obey them. You're like a person that built your house on the rock. Yes. The storms came and it did not knock that house down. So the more, the, the journey for me of wisdom is trying to understand what, what God is like, what God teaches in his word, how he life flourishes, what Jesus taught, and doing my very best to align with those things, but then allowing it to inform my decisions. So when I think of decisions, I think of big categories, and I got this from a book called The Checklist Manifesto, but I think it's you can see it in Proverbs as well, that there are major categories of decisions. There are simple decisions, sure. mm-hmm. like what clothes you wear. Um, there are complex decisions, like if I were going to bake a cake, there would be steps. Mm-hmm. Not that I ever bake cake, but <laughs> if I were going to bake a cake. And then there'd be complicated decisions, so simple, complex, and complicated. A complicated decision tends to be more relational, people-oriented, mm-hmm. complex, mm-hmm. more process-oriented. Um, so the more the more decisions I can make before I make the decision, mm. the better decision I'm going to make. Mm. So uh, another good example in the Bible from this is Daniel mm-hmm. in the Old Testament goes to Babylon. He's mm-hmm. there. He's thrown into the you know the king's court. He's offered all these food, all these drinks, all these rich, and he makes a decision like I I will not defile or he resolved not to defile himself on the mm-hmm. king's food. Mm-hmm. And to honor the ways of God, and that that uh, resolve in his heart, I think, is one of the primary reasons why we still look to Daniel as one of the wisest people yeah. in the Bible, because he's like, okay, I, I will not. Pressure is going to come. So I try to think in terms of like we have um, covenant here for staff members, right? Mm-hmm. And like one of the covenant items that I think is wonderful and beautiful and important. I never want to find myself alone in a room with a woman. Mm -hmm. And the Mm -hmm. reason why is because I don't, I don't ever want to have to make a decision about what do I do? I'm not on an elevator alone with other than my wife or my daughter or my mom. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that result, some of those resolved decisions Mm -hmm. make thousands of other decisions. And our, our, our willpower, our decision-making muscle (laughs) is like a muscle that gets Mm -hmm. fatigued. Yeah. So you're you've heard the little acronym halt hungry alone lonely tired mm. that when you're in that zone you tend to make not as good at decisions worse decisions not better decisions mm. worse decisions mm. so the more I can I can program or habitualize or predecide on big decisions in life the less I have to exercise that muscle number one is it isn't it interesting like when you're trying to do a diet you're more exhausted than when you're fasting, like emotionally <laughs> yes. with decision yep. making. Cause you're constantly like analyzing everything when you're on a diet. But when you're fasting, you're like, Oh, I'm not eating yeah, anything. anything. I right. don't have to make that decision. So trying to decide in advance as many decisions as possible. Hmm. I can't even remember what your original question was. <laughs> <That is laughs> no, no, it's perfect because we were talking about ways to help people make informed decisions. Yeah. And, I think I think that reminder is so important to people that um that it can it can take time to build up that muscle and to make those early decisions so that knowing that future you is going to benefit from you having made some earlier decisions mm-hmm. and it, it's it's worth to take that time and knowing that you're not going to get it all right away there's going to be things that you think about later be like oh yeah I need to may I do this or make this decision now, knowing that in the future that'll come. And right. so it's not its not like you're going to sit down and say, I'm going to make every decision of my life right. right now in advance. It's knowing that it's its little by little and going back to the values and principles, which you talked about, Those having those available help you make decisions, mm-hmm. right? So like... Um, Like if you have, if you take the time to think through and list out, like these are, these are values that are important to me. Like for staff, we have values as, as a staff Mm -hmm. and and we have values as a church. And so uh, for leadership at the church, in terms of making big decisions, is you're able to go back to those values and say, okay, does this, 
does this decision fit in line with these values? Is there right. alignment with stuff that we've already set and agreed upon? Right. Is the direction that we want to go as a church? Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and there, I think that there's a, a handful of those that are so powerful that you can like shape your own mind and your thinking mm-hmm. on in advance. So let me give a couple yeah. examples. Yeah. Like this part of the brilliance of the purpose driven life, right? Like you're the five eternal purposes of God to know, Oh, God made me for worship. God made me to grow. Mm-hmm. God made me for community. God made me, gave me a shape to make a difference. God made me here to share the, put me here to share the difference that he's made in my life. So that can inform my decision making. But the if you take the for example the great commandment, mm-hmm. the great commandment is a phenomenal frame for every day of our life for decision making. Like mm-hmm. every day I can wake up and not have to question, does God want me to love him more right. today? Does God want me to love other people more? That can mm. that can drive my decision making. Mm-hmm. There's some prayers that are super helpful for me. Um in Psalm 19, King David, he writes and he says, "May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, mm. O Lord, my rock mm-hmm. and my redeemer. Mm-hmm. So I pray that prayer. Like I, most days I'm like, okay, God, you know, help me today. I want to be pleasing to you in mm-hmm. my heart, mm-hmm. the meditations, the things I speak. Mm. So help me be pleasing to you. Another one of these, which is not as specific as that, but like praying for wisdom on a daily basis, mm-hmm. just pursuing like, God, give me the wisdom I need to make the right decision, knowing that there are some decisions that um, you're not going to make for me, but I need to make them. Yeah. And right. I know you'll give me the wisdom. Yeah. Sometimes I think when it comes to decision making, we want God to make all. Sometimes we're like, well, God, if you could just make all decisions. <laughs> and this is where, like, the, some of the spiritualism with, mm-hmm. like, you know, t- uh, the reading palm, the, a palm or a psychic or all that, like, just tell me exactly what to do. Where God, I think, in our process of growth is trying to develop people mm-hmm. that are interdependent, related related to one another in the mm-hmm. kingdom, mm-hmm. connected to him. But there's a beauty. Isn't there like a quote from um, uh, the C.S. Lewis screw tape letters about like, in essence, he says like the greatest threat, you know, it's a demon speaking, the greatest threat to our kingdom is like, you know, uh, a, a person who's lost like all all strength or emotions. They they've gone through all this pain, and at the end of all of it, they still want mm. to obey. Mm. They still want to do, like. So there's there's something that God is forming in us that is we are these connected beings to Him mm-hmm. eternally, but we're also we are humans that have a will that God sees and knows, and he's shaping that will to make decisions that he's not actually making the decision. We're yeah. making it, but we're doing it in in a desire to love and please him. Mm. So mm. anyways. No, I was as I was listening to you, I was thinking about, I hear a theme of the scriptures that you've memorized that kind of create guideposts for making decisions. And that several times you talked about, oh, I think about this verse, and I think... But that's because you've memorized them, you've committed Mm -hmm. them. So just thinking about in terms of decision making, I love that picture of just as we memorize God's word, it it gives us boundaries for decision making Mm -hmm. that we can have in place. And it will become a habit when we need to make a decision that those scriptures come to mind and then they they provide that boundary or that guidepost for us. So it's good. So we've been talking a lot about making good and better decisions, but we know that there are barriers that we all face to making these decisions because otherwise we would just make them, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the barriers that people face when it comes to making better decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is kind of funny because I wrote that, I wrote a part of my sermon on that a while ago. And then you guys (laughs) found that in my notes that I had totally forgotten about, (laughs) which was really good. Um, that you did because so I originally like two months ago when I was thinking about this sermon the thing that came to mind was what gets in the way of mm-hmm. good of better decisions mm. and so if you take the the fear of the Lord is like the foundation you could inverse that yeah. right you could like and I would 
venture to say the inverse is pride. Yeah. yeah. So if I think I know all the answers, mm-hmm. I think my way's the right way. Pride to me is like the that's the biggest barrier to making good decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one. Uh, the second would be a lot of times when it comes to decision making, we don't want to we don't want to do the work <laughs> of a hard decision. Yeah. So it, it's like, well, maybe my laziness is the thing that could prevent me from making the right decision. I remember one time in a staff meeting, this wasn't at Saddleback. <laughs> I was going <laughs> yeah, to say, okay, now I'm picturing Telling meeting, stories on us. <laughs> we were talking about like adding services and it was so clear, like, you know, we were max capacity and everybody's like thinking through the implications of if we add a service and all the work that's going to have to do. And I just said, okay, here's what I'd like to ask you guys to do. I know right now you're thinking about this decision through the filter of the work that you'll have to do once the decision's mm-hmm. been made. So I'd like to ask you, for just a moment to put aside what is the work that is going to be required with this decision and just ask the question, what's the right decision? Mm. And then what's later we'll ask what's the right way to do the decision, but right now what's the right decision? So laziness I think can be a big Mm. like barrier to good decision making. Mm -hmm. I found, so we can, we can double click on this a bit. I have found, Personally, if I separate a decision into two categories, like what's the right decision and right. the right for the right reason, that's mm-hmm. one side. That's like the the what and why. Uh-huh. And then what's the right way to implement the decision, the right timing, that's the that's the when and the how. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That if I can bifurcate or separate mm-hmm. those decisions, it allows me to have clear thinking yeah. on on a decision. There's a guy named Adizis. Um, he's this old like con- Jewish consultant mm. and works with businesses. And he says, every leader needs two books. I don't know <laughs> but he says one for making decisions and one for implementing decisions. Yeah. And so laziness is one. Um, another one is fear. Mm-hmm. So fear stands in the way. It blocks my ability. And it's one thing to have like fear on you, but it's another when fear gets in you. Mm. And when fear gets in you, it can become the thing that prevents me from making a courageous decision mm-hmm. or doing the right thing. I know that there's more. I had another one. I wrote down a couple here. Another one is naivety. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what uh, Solomon calls the simpleton. Like they're mm-hmm. just naive. Like mm-hmm. they think, oh, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. You know, I can eat all the food I want whenever I want and never affect me. You know, so it's naive yeah. And, yeah. and thinking. So. Um, those are just some of the major barriers I think of when I think of big decisions or any really any decision. No, I think that's great. I think it definitely speaks to people. Yeah, I think all of these are kind of universally felt of like, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm going through that and I can see that it would take it would take a lot for me to do this. So I'm just going to kind of put it off and mm-hmm. maybe it'll it'll just go away or work itself out somehow <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or whatever it is or that fear of of the unknown in 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 and what the decision may be. And, you know, it seems like the, the go-to answer for these barriers is to bring it back to God mm-hmm. at all time. Every, you know, is, is we have that relationship with God where we can talk with him and be open about these things that we're feeling about the laziness or the pride or the fear mm-hmm. or the naivete yeah, or, or whatever it is, that's stuff that we can bring to God and just say, God, I I know this decision's in front of me, uh, and I'm kind of not wanting to deal with it for one of these reasons, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I just want to be honest with you about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I think another thought that came to mind as I was like, as you were talking, is how there's certain decisions. Okay, so like sometimes you might see somebody that's in like really good shape, and maybe they eat a donut, and you're like, "What's up with that?" <laughs> well. The thing that maybe you didn't see was before that they had worked out and they've been healthy for all these years right. and they had one donut. And it, yeah. But there, there are certain decisions that when you when you make those decisions and you you live in those decisions for a long period of time, um, those decisions guide your life and they put you on a better path. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I would just say there's like a couple of those decisions that are so important that are worth like slowing down to make sure you're making the right decision. Mm. And some of these may be obvious, but let's just, can I walk through a couple of Name them, them please. Um, like who's going to be in charge of your life or my life is probably mm. er, the most important decision. Yeah. And like, do I want to be in charge or do I want the God of the universe who has infinite wisdom to be in charge of my life? Mm-hmm. Well, when you put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> That I think that that's a st- most important starting point. Yeah. Um, secondly, would be related to who you're yoked with, mm-hmm. like who you're doing life with. Mm-hmm. Um, marriage is if if God calls you know somebody to get married, yeah. that's like that decision is a decision that impacts every okay. decision for the rest of their their lives. So if I want to be able to make better decisions, like I'm. I've been married for 20 years. You know, I know you, you guys both are married and that decision, mm-hmm. you're so glad you made that decision, the right mm-hmm. decision. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that that's one that to know like, okay, am I choosing the right kind of person? There's an old line that says that would the person I want to marry want to marry me? That's yeah. a good question mm-hmm. for singles to ask, but wrestling through like, what kind of person do I, you know, do I really want to be married to? Um, the people that like, if you do a business or your workplace, mm-hmm. like the kind of uh, organize, organization that you yoke up with is huge. Who your friends are mm-hmm. is huge. Um, there's so many big categories like that, yeah. that if you, if you get those decisions right, they drive a lot of other decisions yeah. that give you a lot more freedom rather than like, think about the freedom that somebody who's made a good spouse, and this is not to make people who have made bad spousal decisions, because sure. once you made the decision, it's the right decision. But um, the freedom that there is if you've made the right decision with your spouse versus the the bondage and pain that somebody experiences because they made the wrong decision. Mm. And just really allowing ourselves to think categorically big decisions, we want to get those right. Yeah. What is the role of our relationships when it comes to decision-making? Is there um, like, is there, or I should say, how should we think about talking with other people or accountability partners or mentors um, in relation to making better decisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, well, I think in terms of categories of uh, people, categories of relationship, like I know this is like, probably seems so so cliche-ish, but um, I remember my student pastor said, everybody should have a Paul Everybody should have a Barnabas and everybody should have a Timothy. So mm-hmm. Paul in the Bible mentored Timothy. Mm-hmm. Um, Timothy was mentored by Paul and then Barnabas was the encourager. Mm-hmm. So I like to think of who are the people that are mentoring me beyond where I am, mm-hmm. who are the people I'm pouring into and who are the people that are just like, we we encourage each other. You know, I have some friends from high school that I still talk to a couple of them. We've been, you know, on the same journey of following Jesus now for decades. So they're like, mutually encouraging relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, When it comes to people who are not on the same path, Mm -hmm. I want to ask the question, is there an openness in the relationship to my influence with them? Now Mm -hmm. there's some relationships that are like covenantal familial, you know, extended family, all that. It's like, well, I'm not going to (laughs) just not talk to that person because (laughs) they, they make my life less convenient or whatever which is not the case in my life, but I'm just saying like (laughs) categorically. Um, But with family members, I think you can, we can think differently, but people that maybe they're not open to influence. It's not really necessarily beneficial to keep in that relationship. If that person is pulling, it's almost like a trajectory question. Like is the trajectory of my life Mm -hmm. a stronger force than the trajectory of their life? Mm -hmm. And so, and then how do you set up a relationship with, let's say there's somebody who maybe God wants to use you to influence their, their one life with your one life, Mm -hmm. but they're like, well, maybe, maybe going to the bar is not the right place to hang out with that person, but maybe going to the gym with them is the right place Mm -hmm. and taking the relationship out of like, oh, well, this is my best friend that I am with all the time versus like putting that relationship in an appropriate place in my life Mm -hmm. and then saying, who are the people that are influencing me? This is why small groups are so important because those small groups influence us towards following Jesus. Yeah. 
what for people who may have who may know like I made a bad decision mm. or they or they're in this place of fear like I don't know if the decision that I made was good or not if, if for people who are listening and trying to process maybe some recent big decisions whether they be complex or complicated and they're starting to question that what sort of advice or wisdom do you think you could give them on how to move forward with the decisions that they're questioning mm mm-hmm. Uh, I would first ask the question is, did I make a covenant? Mm. Mm. So if I made a covenant, then the way I handle that relationship is very different than if I made a contract. Sure. So like an employment, it might be a a contract. Mm -hmm. A marriage is a covenant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having a kid's a covenant. You know, you're like covenantally committed to that relationship. Yeah. Um, I would say on covenantal situations, I would seek help from a godly, um, wiser, professional Mm -hmm. here at Saddleback. We have lots of resources for Mm -hmm. counseling. If you find yourself in one of those kinds of situations, probably I would, I would get help. Yeah. Um, on contractual, uh, I would want to know like, okay, what are the commitments I've made? Um, and what is the, what's the net effect on, my soul long-term for mm-hmm. keeping or not keeping this decision, uh, yeah. this commitment. So, you know, sometimes you get in a contract, you can negotiate your way out of a contract. Um, or if you find yourself in a contractual situation that is destructive, like you took a job on for more money, but then you got to the job and they're asking you to be dishonest and yeah. da, 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 da. it's like, okay, well, I want to, I want to try to get out of that situation. So, um, Asking the question, like sometimes we get into bias uh, with decisions. Mm-hmm. One of the primary bias that we get into is a sunk cost bias. Mm. So we say like, okay, well, I've sunk so much into this decision. Mm. I don't want to get out because I've sunk it's so gonna much It's going to keep in. digging deeper. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the question of what's the cost of leaving or changing or what's the cost of staying and not changing and to be able to wrestle through, like there may be some, some things that there's going to be a cost to change. Yeah. But there's also a cost to stay and not change and to wrestle through what is that cost mm. for you personally? What's that cost in your relationship with God? And then let that play into it's yeah. a little bit more principled. I don't know if you yeah. want me to be more practical than that. No, well, no, but that goes back to exactly where you started with um, those pre decisions, things that you decide in advance. Because if you decide that your relationship with God and your relationship with your spouse are going to be a certain way, when you find yourself in a situation that the cost mm-hmm. might be that it's it's causing you to act in violation of those predecisions, then those would be helping to guide you and say, yeah, it's going to cost me to leave this thing, but it's going to cost me more right. to stay. And it's going to violate those things that were so important to me that I predecided them. So I think, again, I'm fascinated by the idea of the predecision. I'm just, yeah. my mind is going, oh, how many <laughs> times? And in parenting too, just how we yeah. teach our kids, predecide that. <laughs> Would be nice if we could predecide for our kids. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's you. not a thing. <laughs> Minor grown up, you can't. And I, I, I want to mention in the in the show notes below, we'll we'll link to some resources from Saddleback, like Celebrate Recovery, mm-hmm. a resource, and Saddleback dot com slash care. So um, if you're around and you're struggling with decisions that you mm-hmm. that you made that put you in a place that you're not happy with, those might be resources for you to yeah. look into. Um, for people who who are listening to this, who may have heard what Linda was just talking about, about the pre-decision and everything, what is a good first step or some next steps for people um, to really start to apply everything that we've been talking about in making better decisions? Yeah. I would say to make it a lifelong goal to pursue wisdom. Mm. And I know that's like a bigger like master you know <laughs> yeah. why versus like very tactical but it, when i was maybe like early 30s i remember i had a, a couple of mentors mm-hmm. that they had talked about how they read the proverbs a chapter a day in particular in your 30s cuz your life comes in that for some reason in that decade depending on when you start having kids and get mm-hmm. married and all that a lot comes at you really rapid mm-hmm. in that decade of life you're building your and you need wisdom 
in that season of life. I mean, need it in every season, but that that season for me in particular, I need it. I'm in my 30s. I can attest to this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I survived my 30s. And yes. <laughs> I just came out of my 30s. Um, the That pursuit of wisdom is so important. Reading the book of Proverbs, I, if you're looking for just really tangible, reading mm-hmm. the book of Proverbs, do a chapter a day, um, do it for a year, do it for six months, just do it. And then look for a proverb a day, write it down, try to memorize it or mm-hmm. think about it. You know, there's there's so many like fun, there's so much fun in the Proverbs, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, like so many little things that Solomon says that, you know, like a, um, like a, a foot that is uh, like a lifeless foot or whatever, like a lame foot is a, is a fool with a proverb in their mouth. And so you get the image of like a mouth of leg. Yeah. Out of the mouth. There's so many little things like that, that Solomon gives that are classic just, Solomon. Yeah. They're so fun. A complaining wife is like a constant dripping. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I can say that one. You memorized that one, Linda. (laughs) It's a good reminder. The um, I I also believe asking God for wisdom, just saying, "God, I need your wisdom," and He gives it. Uh, What I have, what I have discovered in my journey is the like when Solomon talks about the way of God's wisdom, like just being delightful and. It's pleasant, and it, mm-hmm. so I think what happens is as you, it's not that you. It's like when you're eating healthy. I find this to be true for myself. Like if I get on a roll, the less desirable foods are not. They're not as desirable. Like you know all the junk food, but I could still get back there. Like I, yeah, yeah I could still break through that wall. Um, but I also I find that to be true with living according to God's wisdom mm-hmm. that. You know, there, there's just so much, the, the way of God with his wisdom is so, there's such a benefit to you. I'll give you a, a good example of this. Like I, we, in our transition here mm-hmm. at Saddleback, mm-hmm. um, I've talked to a lot of other people who uh, have gone through transition. One of the things that I'm deeply grateful for Pastor Rick and Kay and their leadership and the foundation, I've made a deep commitment in my heart um, before God and our church to honor them with my words, like mm-hmm. every, you know, uh, everything that comes out of my mouth, I want it to be positive and honoring and gratitude and all of that. And you know, it's like you could look at that and you could be like, "Well, oh, that's so godly," da, 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 you know. But there's also its benefits. There's a benefit mm-hmm. of what mm-hmm. it does culturally to our church and how it makes my job easier as a leader. Yeah. And so th- that's the way God structured life to work that when you do things God's mm-hmm, way, mm-hmm. it's like life is better. It's it just it mm-hmm. works better. It's not that there's not pain. It's not that there isn't hardship and, and difficulty. And we live in a broken and fallen world. But the ways of God are del- they're more delightful. Mm-hmm. And so to train our soul to want more of God's ways mm-hmm. and wisdom in our life, I think comes out of that daily like Seeking to understand God's heart and His wisdom, and asking Him daily for mm-hmm, wisdom, mm-hmm. Um, and then I would just like ask yourself or ask myself, what are the big categorical like what are what are the top three to five decisions that I'm going to make in this season of my life, and try those big decisions to major on the major decisions. Mm-hmm. And experience the forward momentum of that mm-hmm. to know that that actually helps drive a lot of other decisions yeah. in our lives. Yeah, I love that. And I just, I want to I, I want to point out too. We'll put in the show notes the link to um, a page that we have called Better Resources. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a list of resources that our team put together around um, these different areas of health, your spiritual health, relational health, emotional health, vocational health, physical health, financial health, yes. and uh, educational health. And so so it's just opportunities because all of these all of these messages in this series, better vision, better habits, better priorities, all of these things that you start to to take some ownership of will help you make better decisions. All of these practices, better mindsets, all of these things, if you start to live out just just looking at getting a little better in these areas will impact 
the way that you think about your decisions. Yep. So these resources will help go with that too. Awesome. Um, Andy, this was your message that you wanted to share. So is there anything else that we didn't get to cover that you wanted to make sure got shared? With uh, this? First of all, thank you guys. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Jason, for including me in of this. Of course. Thank you for your hard work and faithfulness. You guys have been at, at this for a while now. It'll be six years this year for, for, uh, for Doable, yeah. It's amazing. So you've been so faithful and you're helping so many people. So thank you for that. Of course. And uh, I just, I'm grateful to be on this show. I'm grateful to be a part of Saddleback and this team and yeah. just pray that this helps somebody. Well, we <laughs> love having you. Thank you so much, Andy, for your time. And and don't forget, friends, uh, this coming weekend, if you're listening to this this weekend, starts the One Life campaign at Saddleback Church. So you can find out a lot more about that. <laughs> <laughs> Applause for One Life at saddleback.com slash one life and um yeah and make sure that to come back next week <laughs> next week we'll be talking about spiritual warfare sure so enjoy that oh, conversation nice. <laughs> and uh friends we love you and uh we'll be back with you again next week if you enjoyed this episode consider giving us a rating or a review on itunes if you do you'll help other people find us in the future You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week.